Hello everybody, hopefully you are prepared for the uh, big solar eclipse Monday. So uh, uh, we're going to be cloudy here, they're saying, but it's sunny right now, but they said it's going to be cloudy. So hopefully you guys are able to step out of your office and see that, but thanks for being on this morning. So we got some things to cover, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, five Minute Money Maker this week was, um, we love when our clients have life events that make moving money easier. But you have to be looking for them or you're going to miss them. So here's all the different things. Now, let's see if anybody... Um, Anybody gets this? Who else, or what else could you do with this information right here that I'm circling? What else would be an appropriate time to, to use that? And review. And when you're doing the and review, what would you talk about? These? Yeah, first of all, whether they're going to be experiencing these things, but what else? Yeah, anybody else they know that are going to be experiencing these things? That's how, you know, you're looking for uh, a uh, referral in. So five key breakdown. When the client makes the point for us, we need to hear it. Listen to this 15-second snippet and find out uh, uh, whether the advisor uh, uh, hears it or misses it. So, yeah, that's, it's all about many times when you're listening, the client will actually do your work for you. And this is an example uh, of that. So please make sure you're uh, watching those things. So I ran across this article on how to be a great conversationalist, and um, I thought it had a lot of great points for us to consider. Because what what is the whole 21-point checklist about? What's it about? Uh, yes, it's about re you know it's about getting them to understand uh, that they need to leave their advisor because they don't trust them anymore. But how do we do that? In what format? By telling them? No, by being a great con by having them tell us, and guess what the definition of a great conversational is? Having them do all the talking. So, don't multitask. Don't be thinking about something else. Be present. How do you think that affects us? Again, we're not going to be doing email or anything like that when we're talking to them, but sometimes we are thinking about something else, and what is that? What comes next in the script? And here's the thing, guys. You need to be awesome at the script so you're not what? If you're thinking about what's coming next in the script, guess what you can't be listening or, or hearing? What they're saying. So it's very important that you're, and that's, you know, in fact, the, the, the tape breakdown was actually about that, where the guy was so uh, focused on what he wanted to say next that he didn't listen to what the client was saying so should we um, if I'm worrying about how to hit a curveball when I'm in the game what am I gonna do If I'm trying to figure out exactly how I'm gonna hit a curveball when I'm, yeah, I'm gonna strike out when do I need to be worried about hitting a curveball in practice so you should do something in practice so often that you can't that you, when you get to the real deal you're what if I'm thinking about how I'm going to box or how I'm going to throw a punch in a boxing match, guess what? I'm dead. I need to be have done that hundreds and hundreds of times outside in, of the ring in practice before I get into the real ring. Does that make sense? Because if I, do, if I don't do that and I'm thinking about what I'm going to say next, I'm going to miss what the client has to say. Don't pontificate, which means they, they call it don't, buy, don't pontificate. We call it don't tell, sell, preach, or teach. They recommend, too, that you need to use open-ended questions. Is What have we been preaching forever and ever and ever? Use open-ended questions. Go with the flow. Don't fixate on what you want to talk about. So that's another thing where if, if, they, give us, um, if they give us what we need, do we then still finish the script? If they've given us what we need, do we finish the script and, and go back and have them repeat what they just told us? No, then they kind of get irritated and say, well, geez, I thought we just covered it. So you, that's where you got to pay attention to what they're saying. If they've said what we want them to say, do we then drag them through the whole script again? Now, how often does that happen? Well, once you get good, it happens more often than you would think. But pay attention to what they're saying. And if they've told us what we want them to say, then don't circle back and, and do the script all over again on that okay so I'll give you an example of that if I'm um, during the um, power of attorney and I say 
geez, what's the, you know, what's the importance of the power of attorney? And they say, well, let me tell you the importance of the power of attorney. You know, my mother went into the, into the hospital, and we were freaked out when she went to the hospital. We were freaked out. And, you know, she was uh, um, hooked up to all these machines. And, and then what happened is my father, who had never taken care of the bills before, we started looking at it, and guess what? Those bills kept coming back in, and he was – so he's worried about his wife, my mom. He's worried about the bills coming in, and she was the main breadwinner. He was, you know, he'd already retired, and so they don't even have money coming in. And then he had to tap into her 401K, and, and you know what? They couldn't even get money out of it because they didn't – they did not have a power of attorney. So, I mean, it was horrible. It put him in a real problem. Now, if they volunteered that story to me, would I then go through the same exact story – that's in the script. Yeah, Wade says, heck no. No, you don't want to. See, so go with the flow. If they've given us what we want, then don't force the script again. Now, again, don't skip or scrimp. If, you do, if you're not 1,000% convinced they've given you what you want. But with what I just did there, would I be 1,000% convinced they understood the kind of stress and strain that not having a power of attorney could put on a family? Yeah, they, they, I'm a thousand percent sure that they get the stress and strain that that can put on the family because he, he did everything I needed him to say. Stress, strain, couldn't get access to her 401k. She said, he said everything I needed to say. So if that's the case, don't force the script, okay? But again, how often does that happen, Jeff? Well, it doesn't happen that often. I mean, more often what happens is you guys don't They'll say something that you don't even acknowledge. You're like, yeah, but but let me let me kind of get us back on track here, and and not acknowledging that is the same as not listening. They think you didn't even hear it. Yeah. If you don't know, say you don't know. But here's the great thing: how often should we be saying I don't know? Not very often. Why? Who does all the questioning? We run the meeting, right, Nicholas? If they don't know, don't let them be wrong. We can never let them be wrong. So what's the, what's the um, template for when they say something wrong? Anybody know what the first thing we do? When they say something wrong, what's the first thing we do? We fall on the sword, yes, but what exactly do you do? That's right, Dave. You tell them, you give them all the reasons that they're right. So, for example, if I say, if I'm incapacitated, what document do I need? What document do I need if I'm incapacitated? And they say, the will. I'm going to tell them why the will is a good answer. I'm going to say, absolutely, because if you think about it, the will is, is where I appoint people to take care of me. I, I, t I assign the people who are going to take care of me, my affairs, etc. And, and it's a legal document that people have to follow. And, then, you know, and I go to the attorney to get that. So, yeah, that's, that's exactly what I would think is that, is the will would take care of all those things. And when I went to the, um, then, okay, so now, did I tell them they were wrong at all there? Good. And then I'm going to say, now, but now I have to ask some questions, smaller questions, easier questions for them to get it right. So I'm going to say, now, when I went to the attorney, did I just get one form filled out or did I get three or four forms filled out? Three or four. And one of the ones we just talked about was when I die, when I die and my family gathers around to find out where my ass, uh, you know, assets are going, you know, and the executor is sitting there is in charge of that, what document did we call that? Well, that was the will. Yeah, so that was the will. Now, we have another document, and that's called the power of attorney. So what's the power of attorney for? Is that the will is for when I'm dead. power of attorney is for when I'm what? See, would they have ever, understood, would they have ever recognized then that I'm correcting them by doing it that way? So when they answer the wrong answer, I tell them why they're right for a minute or so, and then I circle back and ask them easier questions so they can get the answer right the second time through, but they'll never realize that I'm actually correcting them. Does that make sense? And listen, if your mouth is open, you aren't listening. Listen with the intent to understand, not to respond. See, you, you should already know the script, so you shouldn't be worried about what you're going to say. You should be worried about what they are saying. Listen with the intent to understand what they're saying, not to respond. If we, knew, if we could read their minds, how many people would we sell? 
Uh -huh, all of them. And guess what listening with intent to understand is doing? We're, re -listen we're seeing what's going on in their head. Dudes, they're giving you what's going on in their heads. Don't, don't underestimate the importance of that. Make sure you're listening to what they're saying, then respond. Don't worry about what you're going to say until after they're done talking. Then you can respond. And remember, what tool do we have to make sure you shouldn't be worried about what's, what you're going to say next? What tool do you use where you shouldn't be worried about what you're going to say next? What tool do you use? The crib notes, right, Jerry? You have the crib notes right in front of you. So you should, if you get stuck, you can just glance down and you know right where to go back. Does that make sense? And if you think of the 15-minute um, the, uh, drill, the 15-minute drill, all of these things are designed to what? Get the client to talk more. These are all designed to get the client to talk more. Giving them little verbal pats on the back with agreement, pair it back, or empowering, if we do that, what's that going to encourage the client to do? Talk more. If we ask questions instead of making statements, what's that going to get the client to do? Talk more. If we ask open-ended instead of closed-ended questions, it's going to get them to talk more. Not over-talking them. We'll get them to talk more. Laughing at their... Uh, when they say something that's funny, we'll get them to talk more. Not correcting them, not letting them get confused. Is, uh, or if they get confused, taking the blame for that. That's going to get them to talk more. So all of these things are getting them to talk more. It's all about thinking, I want to understand what they're saying, what's going on in their mind. That's what all of these skills are about. And if we go back to the conversationalist, isn't that what all of this is about? All these conversations are talking about what you say or about what they say. I get Again, one is use open ended questions, what you say, but it, what you're saying there is simply another tool to get them to say more. Does that make sense? Super. So I want to talk a little bit today about um, what's going on with the marketplace. Now, Jeremy Grantham is one of the very few guys that, um, that um, has some sort of prescient, prescient knowledge of what's going to happen. Because this guy predicted the market bubble in 1999. And he predicted the market bubble in 2007. How many people do you know that have predicted? Uh, there's lots of people that are predict one. How many people predict two? This is the only guy that I, I know that predicted both of them. He's highly, highly um, uh, respected in the industry. Now, here's the weird thing. In spring 2015, which was two years ago, right? Over two years ago, he predicted the market would hit 2250 which a lot of people at that point thought, because we weren't even in the reach of 20,000 at that point. He predicted the market would hit 2250, and then it would get very volatile. Well, guess what's happened to, a little after two years later? It's hit 2250. So we are not, you know, there's so many reasons why we should um, worry about um, what's going on with the market. Number one is, is, are we, how many markets have gone longer than the current market. How many bull markets have gotten longer than the current bull market? Yep, one. Um, when you look at the cape, where's the cape? How many times has the cape been higher than it is right now? Twice. And what happened both times? Crashes. Little crashes or big crashes? Big crashes. But here's what he says. Guess what Jeremy Grantham says about technical analysis? What do you think he says about technical analysis? No, he doesn't say it's BS or, or rubbish because you know what? Can can um, the Cape be can can we have an average price earnings ratio of 100? So it would take 100 years of earnings. If the average stock took 100 years, 100 years to to make the profits. To reach where it's uh, um, prices, would that be no? He, he he doesn't say it's rubbish. What he says is it sets things up. The the analysis the analogy I would give is if I'm in a room full of um, uh, crispy old newspapers and gasoline, a cans full of gasoline, does that mean the market's going to go or the the room is going to you know burst into combustion, burst into flames? No, it means that what? Conditions are what? 
So if I walk into a room that's just a cement room, what's the likelihood that room's going to um, um, burst into flames? Not very high. I mean, I'd be, I would be, I would be fine with betting on the fact that that room's not going to go up in flames anytime soon. But how? But if I'm in a room full of crisp, ready to burst into piles of newspaper and cans full of gasoline, am I going to bet that that room will not go up in flames? Heck, no. I just don't know. But I could I tell you exactly when it's going to go up in flames? No. <clears throat> so all that room needs is what? A match. And does the match a spark? So does the spark need to be big in that room? No. If I put a spark in a, in a room, uh, in a cement room, is that going to do anything? How about a candle? What if I even pour a little bit of gasoline on that cement room with nothing else in it? What's going to happen? The room going to burst into flame? Yeah, for how long? Boom, boom. But what's going to happen? So his point about technical analysis is, is that it sets it up. The market doesn't follow technical factors, but the technical factors set something up. And what that thing, the thing that it sets up is what? For a match or a spark to blow it all up. Because what's going to blow it all up is what? The technical indicators are what? It's right there on, this, on, this, on the screen. What's going to blow up the, the market? Human behavior, people, investor psychology, that's what's going to blow up the market. Um, how many of you did, let me see if I can get some people who, said, who watched the big short. Did you watch the big short? Okay. Who was the math, the guy that um, Christian Bale played, the mathematician? What was his name again? The doctor or something or other? You know the guy I'm talking about, right? The guy who walked around with bare feet? He knew that when, he knew exactly when, when the real estate market was going to crash, didn't he? He knew exactly when the real estate market was going to crash because when the interest rates went up and the adjustable rate mortgages jumped into, you know, jumped 3 4%, it was going to put everybody underwater. He knew exactly when that was going to happen. He could see in the mortgages when the adjustable rate mortgages were going to, were going to not bump up, were going to jump up. He knew exactly when it was going to happen. And what happened when that happened, when, when they got to that date? What happened when they got to that date? No, it didn't crash. What happened? No, it didn't default. What happened? Nothing. And then the next month, what happened? Nothing. Because everybody was trying to hide those numbers. Everybody, the, the banks were trying to pump numbers in. The banks were trying to unload that stuff because they didn't want to get stuck with it. They wanted to unload it on somebody else. So it, 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 he knew exactly what was going to happen because all the indicators were there. And it, it, it was going to happen. It was just a matter of what? How long... People could cover the other. The companies could cover up those the the problems that were happening, and they were trying to cover it up and trying to cover it up and trying to cover it up and trying to cover it. It finally got it got to the point, accelerated to the point where they just couldn't cover it up anymore, and they have ex and they exited out fast enough that the whole thing went to heck in a handbasket. So the room he saw the room was full of newspapers and gasoline, but could he predict the exact moment it was going to happen? He did. He predicted the exact moment was going to happen, but the markets and the companies tried to hide it, and they pushed it out month after month after month until finally uh, it, it was accelerating to the point where they couldn't get uh, covered up anymore, and they had exited uh, uh, to the exits as much as they could possibly exit, and boom. So what's my point there? That the market's going to crash? Yeah, it is. <laughs> but is my point that the market's going to crash tomorrow? The market could crash tomorrow, could crash next month, could crash next year. But should we be prepared or surprised? Should we, when it happens, should we be surprised or say, uh -huh, I knew that was going to happen sooner or later? Got to be prepared. So this, let me, oops, just a second here. London Millennial Bridge. Does anybody um, remember what happened on the inaugural day when they opened this bridge? Does anybody remember what happened when they opened this bridge? Oops. Oh, wind. Yep, Dave, wind. So what happened was they had about a third of the amount of people the bridge could actually hold, and the wind hit it, and the wind started to rock it a little bit, and guess what that did to the people? 
It pushed them to one side or another, and then guess that, what that did to the bridge? All the people started, the wind was blowing and uh, making the, the, the bridge go back and forth, and then people started to, to move over to the left, and then over to the right, and then over to the left, and then over to the right, and guess what that, it, the, the, the bridge started to go swing. They had to evacuate that bridge because as everybody adjusted the same way, what did it do to the bridge? It caused an overcorrection in one direction, and it twisted it. And they had to evacuate the bridge, and they had to go fix it so that would never happen uh, again. What do you think my point is there? We just talked about it. What's going to cause the markets to, to finally go? People. And when people go, guess what? So the markets are even riskier than we think. Here's why. What are the new risks that we never had before? The emergence of new financial capitalism that isn't new it's new all over again, let me put it that way. Uh, the rise of speculation, decline of investing, the increase of derivatives and use of leverage, shadow banking and the lack of transparency, and the problem of too big to fail. So financial, uh, financialized capital, uh, capitalism. The top 1% control 23% of assets in 1929. Is that a problem? Is it a problem when 1% controls a huge amount of money? Yeah, because how, how many people now have to, on that bridge, how many people have to move in order for the markets to have huge problems? Very few. Now, and, they, and here's the sad thing. They still used other people's money to take risks. Does that sound familiar at all, guys? So even though they controlled 23% of the assets for their own, were they putting their own monies at risk or other people's at risk? What was happening in 2008? All these guys, when, the, when, when Wall Street was doing all these stupid things with mortgages, what did they get in their, in their, uh, pay, stub, on their pay stub the next year? Bonuses. They didn't get hurt at all. By all the stupid things they did with other people's money, they didn't get hurt at all, did they? By 1980, though, look at the top 1% only controlled 9% of the assets. Only controlled 9% of the assets. Where do you think we are today? By 2007, the 1% controlled 23% of the assets. And what happened in 2008? They were back to where they were in 1929. Now, you want to guess where we're at today, anybody? Lower or higher than that? Top 1% controls 35% of the assets now. More risky or less risky than we were before? See, look, look at this. One, if, we, if the U.S. land mass were divided in U.S. wealth, 1% would own this, 9% would own this, 30% would own this, 20% would own this, and 40% would own that. That is risky. Why? Few people, a few people can do what to the markets? Now, let me ask you a question. Smart people, they never, you know, they don't panic and they don't do stupid things, right? The big guys, these guys, they, they don't do stupid things and, um, well, what do we find out in 2008? Do they do stupid things? For those of you who watched the big short, how many of these guys said, how many people on Wall Street said that, no, there is no problems here? Everybody except what? A huge group of people or a small group of people? A very small group of people. This is a problem, guys. This is a huge problem. Why is this important? In the last five years, the financial sector contributed 20% of the GDP, but reaped actually is way higher than 40% of corporate profits now. So. Are, are we, is our economy going up because we're making more things? Yeah, it is. But, it, but what percentage of the economy going up is because we're making more things versus imaginary thing, making imaginary things? When, I'm, when I make an imaginary, I'm not talking about imaginary like um, software. Software is real. Software is real. I'm talking about imaginary things in the financial markets. And when you're, when, corp, when, when, um, uh, profits are going up with imaginary things, is that less or more risky? It's way risky. The rise of speculation decline of investing. Turnover in 1951 was 25%. 1951, 
1998 went up to 100 percent. What happened in uh, a couple years later? Boom. Crash. 2008 it got up to 215 percent. Where is it today? Do you think? See if everybody knows this. Dave, you're right. Nope, not 300. Oh, very good, Dave. Very close. 130 percent is what turnover is on average today. Good or is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because why is it a bad thing, guys? You know, I was talking to a guy. So the markets are still going up. The markets are still going up. But here's the thing: if you if you pay attention to the markets. There, it's very, most indicators are lagging. Almost all indicators are lagging when it comes to the market. But there is one indicator that has been proven to be uh, uh, leading. There is one indicator that's proven to be leading is that if you look at the market, if you look at the market and the vast majority of stocks are not hitting new highs, in fact, they're well off their new highs and trending downwards. The vast majority of stocks are trending downwards and not hitting new highs. That's a problem. Because what you generally find is at the end of a market, when the market's hitting the last breath and the market's still going up, what's making the market going up? Go up. The vast majority of stocks or just the few big ones at the top? Just the few big ones at the top. Guess what's been happening for the last six months? Want to take a wild guess? Only a few companies like Apple, the big guys, are, are, are dragging the markets up. If you look at the vast majority of stocks, guess what? The vast majority of stocks hit new highs six months ago, and guess what they've been doing for the last six months? Trending down. This is a problem. This is a, this is, that is a, uh, that's a leading indicator of a market correction. So how, how much does turnover cost? We know how much that costs, and I'm going to spend time uh, talking about that. Well, and can I jump yeah, in go. there for a second? Yeah, please, yeah. About, uh, so, about turnover or what? A little bit about what you just said. Okay. Um, so a lot of you guys, and I don't know who you are, and I don't hear all the stories, but a lot of you guys are going to start to experience something where you're going to say, well, my clients are coming in and they're pissed off because my money manager isn't making money and the markets are doing so well. That's because your money manager isn't buying and holding. He's trading in the vast majority of stocks that aren't doing that well. And so... You're going to start to come in and see some pissed off people, and that's your signal that, uh-oh, um, this is a really, really tight, narrow market. It's only a few companies that are driving the gains. And if you're not invested in those companies, or you are, but you're also invested in a lot of losers, your clients are going to see their portfolios be flat, but they're going to see on the news that we're breaking all these yeah. records, and you guys are going to be in a bind. And that's that's well put, Jeff. Because that's that's a real problem when the market's going up. But how many of your mark money managers are only investing in five, six stocks? So they're investing in a whole bunch of stocks to be diversified. See, and and, the, and, and most of the markets are weighted or unweighted. They're weighted. So the, when the market's going up, you just see when Apple goes up. That's a huge chunk of the S and P 500. That's a huge chunk of the of the Nasdaq. That's 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 um. Uh, so you're not seeing what's happening underneath, but your money manager, as Jeff just pointed out, uh, he's right on target, is invested in in a hundred different stocks, or fifty different stocks, and they're not going to be loading it up with with eighty percent in Apple and the rest, you know, in a small amount in the rest. It's going to be well, much more well diversified, and you're going to start to have to deal with that. And that's not a fun thing. So yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Jeff. Uh, somebody uh, uh, actually put it, a couple of people talked about derivatives. Let's talk about that. In 2007, there were 62 trillion dollars in derivatives, and if, uh, the uh, 2008 crash was how it was was caused. Uh, how much did derivatives weigh in on the 2007 crash? Small or large? Did it weigh in a lot or sm uh, just a little bit? Large, a bunch. In fact, Warren Buffett has called derivatives the, the weapons of mass destruction. Why do you think Warren Buffett calls derivatives weapons of mass destruction? Because it can do how much damage? It brings down the markets, Jonathan. It, it can do huge amounts of damage. 
2009, look at how much it jumped. From 2007 to 2009, it jumped to 200 or 600 trillion. So that's where all those uh, unsecured mortgages and debenture, uh, bond debentures, all those things were occurring right there. So any idea of where we are today? And this is the small estimate. The problem is, does anybody really know how many derivatives we have today? That's the problem. But I want you to understand what we're talking about. Because you know what? Numbers, uh, numbers mean nothing. Numbers mean nothing. Let's take a look. It's 20 times larger than the global economy. Even that means nothing. But a picture paints a thousand words. So Paul Wilmot... Uh, I keep uh, talking about a picture. We're going to get there in one second, guys. Sorry. Uh, one of the biggest risks of the world's financial market health today is the 1.2 quadrillion. See, this is the low end. 1.2 uh, quadrillion in derivatives market is complex. It's unregulated. And it ought to be a concern to world leaders. And uh, the Paul Wilmot, Doctorate of Economics at uh, Oxford University. But I think a picture paints a thousand words. So let's take a look at this. So. Money in markets, so right here is how much, as compared to everything else in the marketplace, this is Bitcoin. This is how much effect Bitcoin has in the marketplace. This is silver. This is Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, and uh, the, the uh, uh, Carlos of, in Mexico, Carlos uh, Sim. Okay, this is the big companies, world's biggest companies, Microsoft, Apple, uh, uh, Google, Exxon, this is the Fed's reserve balance sheet. This is coins, all the coins and banknotes out there. This is uh, commercial real estate. So this is Bitcoin compared to commercial real estate. Gold, look at silver compared to gold. Now we drag down further. This is narrow money. Narrow money is the money that's actually liquid and can easily get your hands on. And actually get your hands on the money. Then we have all the stock markets of the world. All the stock markets of the world. Then we have broad money, which is not is not the is all the money out there, both easy, the money you can easily get at and money that's locked up. Okay. Then we have global debt. Here's the global debt. Here's the U.S. debt. Here's uh, Europe's debt, Japan's debt, China's debt. So this is all the world debt. Now we come to derivatives. So look at this. Uh, we'll go back. There's, as we go through the size of these, okay. There's all the debt. So just the fact that we have this much debt as compared to how much money is that a problem? Just, I mean, with with all this debt as compared to all the money, the the money that's out there, is that a problem? Yeah, more debt than we have all the money in the world. That's a problem. But let's look at now at derivatives. Ready? Here's derivatives. Okay, this is the low end estimate of what we're in derivatives. That's the high end of we have derivatives. So I'll do that again. Federal Reserve, gold, commercial real estate, all the stock markets, broad money, which means all the money out there, debt, and then here we come with derivatives. If this doesn't scare you guys, uh, those of you... But and how many of you guys do you really think that your money manager? Do you really think your money manager is going to be able to help you out with that? Your money manager's got to figure it out. Your money manager is going to be able to avoid that problem when it goes. Uh uh uh, uh. dudes. Because when it goes, guess what? When it goes, what's going to happen to everybody? Yeah, we all fall down exactly. What happens when a company uses a hedge with derivatives bought from another company, and that company fails or can't make promised payments? 
you know what happens. And guys, are derivatives regulated? No. They're not. And even if they, well, every time they try to regulate, what happens? Squeeze one side of the balloon, another balloon uh, uh, bails out. And here's the real problem. I mean, if you want to get right down to it, this is the problem. Glass-Steagall Act occurred after 1929, during the Depression, saying that banks should not be in the business. They should not be in the business of, of lending, be, you know, uh, of, of working with consumers, but they shouldn't be in inv uh, uh, investments. And that passed in 1933. It worked perfectly. And then what happened in 1999? They repealed it. What's important about 1999? What's been happening since 1999? What's been happening since 1999? More crashes, more what? More derivatives, more using other people's monies for risk, more of what? Volatility. When investment banks rule, why, you know, it, it, I mean, why lend money when you can get it from the Fed at 0% leverage best? Now, finally, the, the, the Fed is changing that, but still, what are banks doing? They're still taking advantage of it. Why worry about leverage bets when you're too big to fail? Why make an honest living when you can pay out huge bonuses each year? And are banks too big to fail again? Yes. Not, not by little, but by a lot. So, Dave, they let one fail. Did they whole let the whole fucking industry fail, or just one? So the thing is, Dave's pointing out, well, they let one fail, but yeah, they let one fail. Why? They couldn't get it because the, the, the United did the United States even have enough money to bail these guys out, all of them? No, we didn't. So, guys, right now, having all your money in the market is what? Silly. So what can you do? Understand that financial landscape has changed. Communicate those changes to clients and the public. Should you be telling your clients that your money manager has it figured out and they're going to they're going to limit it, they're going to lower the downside. You're not going to take you know, you may not get all the upside, but you're also not going to get all the downside. Can you make those promises, guys? Can you make those promises? I got three people saying no. I need a lot more no's than that. So the th keep going. Okay, now I'm getting 40, 50, 60. So the only promises we should be making to clients is this. When the market goes up, our account's going to go up. When the market goes down, on the equity side, I'm talking about the equity side, with money managers, etc. When the market goes up, we're going to go up. When the market goes down, we're going to go down. And the nice thing is, historically, the market has gone up more often than down. Can I look somebody in the eye and be 100% uh, uh, um, uh, truthful in saying those things? Would I bet my house on that? Yes, I'd bet my house on that. I'd bet my house that if I'm in a money manager that's, that's basically a, a, uh, well diversified that when the market goes up, they're going to go up. When the market goes down, it's going to go down. And, they're, and, and we can look historically that they've gone up more often than down. Making any other promises about algorithms, the guy's got something figured out, etc. guess what? I mean, here's how bad it's gotten. Um, you, we, we talked about this here about a year ago. They are now, there, there's a, um, a, a financial company that built its company and its servers, its computer servers, in condos across from the exchange because they now have this this much of an edge on other people. If you took a stood on first base in a in a baseball field, stood on first base, and then looked at home plate, they can now the time it takes from light for a, turn on a flashlight for the light to go from first base to home. That's how much of an edge they have over everybody else. And what what are they looking for edges? Well, they, they look for edges that when the government is going to make an announcement about interest rates. When the government is going to be making an announcement about um, unemployment. When the government is going to be making an announcement about anything, guess what they're in there to do? What are they doing? They're beating everybody else to the punch. And then there's one right behind them that they beat everybody to the punch. And another, another. And where do you think your money manager is when it comes to beating those guys to the punch?
Dead last. Yeah, different stadium, right. Dead last. So, Wall Street Journal, despite the assurances of the financial industry, stocks are always, always a risky investment. So, this is Wall Street Journal saying this. Despite the assurances of the financial industry, stocks are always a risky investment, and the longer you hold them, this is, this is counterintuitive. This is, this is against every, I would say 95% of advisors would fail this question. Are stocks riskier or less risky the longer you hold them? They're more risky. The longer you hold them, the better your chance of getting blindsided in a downturn. How many advisors would pass that question, would get that question right on a test? We know 100% of, basically 100% of consumers would get that wrong. How many advisors would get that wrong? The vast majority. The usual way of mitigating that risk is diversification. It holds, but it holds no guarantees either. For the simple reason, investments don't always move the way we want them in relationship to one another. Did we experience that in 2008? A hard look at stocks. It may be hard to let go of the belief that buying and holding stocks is a surefire way to key, surefire key to asset growth. But that's because people have been lulled into thinking that long-term stock investing greatly reduces the risk. The truth is stocks are risky no matter how long you hold them. And guys, I just did this twice over the last year. Over the last 55 years, what percentage of time, what percentage of the time did stocks keep you ahead of inflation over the last 55 years? What percentage of time? Very good, Wade. Dave's got it. 33 and 30%. Yep. So that means, that, very good, Michael. So that means two-thirds of the time, what? You're not, stocks are not keeping you ahead of inflation. One-third of the time that it is. It's the biggest lie that our industry tells, tells clients. Very good. I got tons of 30s and 33s. Very good, guys. I'm, I'm impressed. That means two-thirds of the, you know what? But I got tons of people didn't answer that. So if you don't know that, guys, that means you're a good advisor or you're a hazard to your clients. Because if you're telling your clients to stay in stocks because you're going to be a, 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 a it's going to keep you have inflation. But over the last 55 years, that's only been right a third of the time, and you've been wrong two thirds of the time. What would you call an advisor that's making those kind, you know, making those kind of assurances to their client, where hey, don't worry, the market's going to keep you ahead of inflation. And the the guy, well, how, what would you think of a doctor that said, hey, so Jeff, you, you're going to go in for surgery, and I'm going to tell you this. This, you need this surgery because it's going to help you survive. What would you think if you found out later that two-thirds of that was true one-third of the time and a lie two-thirds of the time? Yeah, I'd be upset. That's scary. And it's interesting now that the, the comment board has got eerily quiet. Why do you think the comment board has got eerily quiet? Why do you think the, con, the comment board here, guys, has gotten eerily quiet? gotten really quiet now. Yeah, too much in stock is what I would think. There are a number of different approaches that demonstrate why conventional wisdom about stocks is wrong. One of them has to do with the bear markets, which happen regularly. The long growth stretch that began in 1983 and lasted through 1990s has not been the norm. That has not been the norm. The problem is, when, did most, of, when have most of our experiences been? When did most of us get into the industry? During the, the longest bull market in history. So guess what we think? And the longer you hold on to your stocks, the greater chance of these downturns. What's more, the idea that stocks do well in the long run isn't a practical guideline for invest individuals. For one thing, the long run means something different to different people depending on their ages and goals. For some, it's 10 years. For others, it's 30. Guys, how long did it take for people that invested in um, the NASDAQ to see their money, you know, in 2000, for, to see their money again? To get back to ground even, 15 plus years. Seven, it was actually 17 years. You're right, Jonathan. So 15, some, we got a lot of 15s, but it was actually 17 years. Uh, for the S&P 500, it was 15 years, yep, because it, it, it got back to where it was, then it fell down again in 2008, and it took another uh, uh, three years to get back to ground even. So um, these are problems. While the odds of getting good stock performance over the time are good, the consequences of a downturn can be severe, depending on how steeply the market's decline, how much you have in the market, and when the downturn hits in your lifetime. The problem with our clients is what? Are they 20 or are they 60? They don't have, I mean, 10 years to them, believe me, the difference between age 60 and age 70 is what, 10 years? Heck no. It's an eternity. Why? 
What happens to health during those 10 years? What happens to the ability to travel, to do, to go, to do all sorts of things between, from seven, 60 to 70, and then from 70 to 80? Can they wait? If they want to do something, they need to do it now. When you're 20, guess what? You can wait till you're 30. You can wait till you're 40. But boy, when you're 60, you can't wait till you're 70. You should be going on that world trip when you're 60, not when you're 70. And if you haven't done it by the time you're 70, you should do it 70 rather than 80. They don't have time to recover. Do you want to get in there, Jeff? I thought I heard you. Oh, yeah, something dinged. I think it was my phone. But no, I actually do have a comment. Um, one of the things, so thoughts about diversification have really changed over the years. And so one of the things that's it's easier to see with the math, but diversification is a function of volatility. So the less volatile the markets are, the less diversified things are going to be, are going to appear to be and actually be. The more volatile the markets are, the less diversified things are going to seem and act. So for us, what that means is in a good market, when the markets are, when we're in a bull market, we're not very volatile. And so everything looks diversified. But all of that changes. Even if you didn't change your portfolio, when the market goes down and becomes more volatile, all of your assets are going to act alike. So people say, well, don't diversify by asset class. That's not going to work. And we've seen that. When the markets go down, everything goes down. Even though it appeared that we were diversified when the markets were up, that's only because there was no volatility. That's why indexed annuities make good counters to stocks because you're not diversifying by asset class. You're actually diversifying by management style. With stocks, most people are what we would call strategic investors, buy and hold. Indexed annuities are what we call absolute return. They're, get, they're going for positive returns no matter what the markets do, irrespective or, or off to the side of what the markets are doing. And that's why they make such a good hedge. Yeah, that, that, make... Can I just be in there for a second on that? Because uh, the best diversification is not something that when the market goes down, Yours goes up. The best diversification is something that never goes down. That's what I, the index annuities do for us. Can bonds go down when the market goes down? Did they in 2008? Yeah. So the best diversification is is if I if I do I want if I have 15 baskets of eggs in the back of my pickup truck and we hit a pothole, what's going to happen to all of them? Well, okay, then I put them all in my lap, and when I hit a pothole, what's going to happen to all of them? What I want is something that when I see the pothole coming, I can what? Pick that basket up and, and cushion it so that there's nothing gets broken. The best diversification is not something that is not correlated. The best diversification is not something that's not correlated to the, to the um, other investments. The best... Uh, um, Diversification is something that does not go down when other things go down and still yeah, goes up. Yeah, go ahead. It, it's a hard thing to understand because if you looked at a portfolio in Morningstar that was evenly balanced between stocks and bonds, right now it would look diversified. But when the markets go down and volatility goes up, that same portfolio will look highly correlated. So looking at your diversification – it isn't going to help you. You're going to lose money. You're only diversified in good markets. You can't be diversified in bad markets. It's impossible. We'd like to think that, and that's what they tell. But the, Wall Street has been telling us things forever, like we're going to get, uh, stocks and keep ahead of inflation, that you can actually be diversified, uh, that the longer you're in, the less risk you have. All these things are the polar opposite of, of the truth. But when you're aiming to meet your aspirational goals, there is a way to limit your downside risk by using instruments that let you limit your losses. Da da! What's that talking about? FIA, as far as I'm concerned. The fallacy is that investing in the stock market is less risky over long periods than short, than short periods. It's not. It's riskier. The longer you're in, the riskier it gets. Guys, especially right now, the, the longer you, the bull market runs. The less riskier, the more risky your accounts get. The more risky, but right now, people think what? 
The market's risky or not risky. Read the articles. Read the articles, even by really bright guys. And what are they saying? That it's not risky. They're coming up with all sorts of reasons. This time it's different. This time the P.E. ratio doesn't matter. This time, uh, you know, they're coming up with all sorts of reasons. And why does Wall Street keep telling us that this time it's different? Don't worry about it. Why are they saying that? Because if they didn't say that, it'd be a self-prophesizing. Uh, uh, the, the people are going to pull money out, and it's going to happen. So they're trying to hide this as long as they possibly can. This is not my opinion. It's a mathematical fact. Well-known academic financial experts. This is Wall Street, or this is the Mint. Um, it's a mathematical fact. Well-known academic financial experts, options traders supported by historical evidence and largely ignored by public and financial advisors alike. In the more normal times, we have panic, asset bubbles, financial crisis, recessions, and flash crashes. Part of the reason we expect high returns from stocks is because we know these things can, can and do happen. We demand to be compensated for dipping our toe into such a risky pool. The longer we stay in the market, the more likely we are to experience a disaster. Just like the longer you stay in a sketchy corner, doesn't mean you're going to get mugged now, but guess what? Eventually, what's going to happen? You're going to get mugged. You can believe the stocks are, uh, have... I'm sorry, you can believe that stocks have higher expected returns and that the general trend of the market is up. I believe both. And I do too. I personally believe both too. But you can invest in stocks, and I do. And you can also understand that stock investing is risky and you have no idea how much money you'll end up with at the end of a long investing career. It could be less, much less than you'd expect. The market itself considers long-term investing risky. You know this by looking at option trades. Guys, do you, know, do you understand what he's saying there? The market itself considers long-term investing risky. We know this by looking at option trades. Why, what does that mean? The longer the spectrum you look out, the cheaper or the more expensive the options are? Yeah, the more. Of course, you have to pay. That's a fact, guys. That's a fact. That's telling you. That is a fact. So it should, <laughs> Of course, you have to pay for the option. And the later the option, the higher the price. Insuring against the market loss over a 10-year period costs more then assuring a one-year. Guys, then we should, if, if we're convinced the market's going to go up in 10 years, should the option price for a 10-year option be lower or higher? If we're so 100% certain the market's going to go up in 10 years, guys, if there's nothing else that you get from this call, there's nothing else you get from the call, this is the proof. If we're 100% sure the market's going to go up in 10 years, what should the option price cost? Should be even money, which means the option price should be what? Cheap, zero, zippo, should be even money. And instead, it's what? If you get nothing out of that, even you guys that think you're freaking stock market experts, you can, can have a freaking stock market expert deny what this is telling us. If we truly believe that there was very little risk of the market going down in the next 10 years, what would stock options cost 10 years from now? They'd be cheap. See, the difference between growth of a city, forest, fire, and, and retirement account. How long does it take to build a city, a for, grow a forest, build a house, build a retirement account? How long does it take for an earthquake to, to destroy a city, a fire to burn a forest, a sinkhole to eat a house, or a market crash to eat a retirement account? It takes years and years and years to do this. It takes inst virtually no time for these things to destroy what took years to build. So what did, what do we learn here? When you don't know what you don't know, that's the sign of a genius. When you don't know what you don't know. So anytime somebody tell, starts telling me they got the market figured out, guess what? What did Jeremy Grantham say? I could sit here and, and tell you what all the technical analysis is going to say, but in the end it would mean nothing because the market's going to do what the market's going to do, and I have no clue when the market when the investor psychology will change on a dime. So you're responsible for all of your decisions with your clients' monies, both good and bad. And guys, can you please remember that this is, this? we forget and we don't treat our clients' monies as our own. You need to be treating your clients' money as your own. Let me ask you a question. If you have your clients' monies in an FIA, you know, at least 50% or whatever in an FIA, and the market goes up 20% and your clients only get 10% of that, did you really hurt your client? I got two no's, three no's, come on. The market goes up 20% and you only, your client only goes up 10 Did you hurt your client? 
But I tell you what, if the market falls, they do not see that, Dave. It, Dave, what the frick? I hope you educate your clients better than that. So everybody else is getting the right answer. So we haven't hurt them. But I tell you what, when the market goes down 20%, and let's say your clients only go down 10%, have you still hurt them? Yeah. And here's why. How is their sleep? Good or bad? How was their decision on whether they should go on vacation this year? Easier or harder? So guys, you have responsibility. You cannot make people happy. You cannot make people happy, but you can make them really sad. And you know what? When the market goes up 10, and if you sold an FIA right, guess what? Do they know that they're only going to get 10 when the market goes up 20? So should they have a problem with that? You sold the FIA right. No, in fact, who told who told you that they wanted something that would only go up 10 when the market went up 20? They did. How many times? Once or a gazillion? So make sure right now you should not have clients in bonds because what's happening to the QE? It's happening to quantitative easing. And, and my gosh, you need to have that safety net for when the market goes, when the investor sentiment finally turns, and will we ever know when it's turned? Because if the market goes down, if it turns, if the market goes down 10% and then comes back up, does that mean that it's that it's that it, that was the correction, or what can happen after the market goes down 10 and and comes back? When you look at most market downturns, does it go straight down, or does does it go down, up, down, up, down? up, down. Does it look spiky or is it a nice smooth down? Yeah, spiky. So guys, the 50-50 means that all their money will go up when the market goes up, so you're not cheating them at all. But when the market goes down, at least 50% won't go down, which gives them the bravery to do what? Gives them the courage to do what? Hold on to that other 50%. But I tell you what, if they are heavily weighted in stocks and bonds and that whole portfolio goes down, I don't care what you tell them, what are they going to do? And we've been talking about this on all the recent surveys. Basically, 80% of people say that if the market falls 30%, they're going to take their money out. Only about 10% at 10%, only about 25% at 20%, but basically 80% at 30% say they'll take their money out. And then what have you done to your client? Can you say, wasn't my fault they should have held on? Whose fault is it then? Years, because you should have been able, uh, positioning their portfolio so that if things go bad, that they can live with it. And taking a little test, taking a uh, volatility test or taking a risk test is worth what, guys? By filling out answers, what's that worth? Nothing. Why? Because it's just them and their mind. Saying I can live with a 30% downturn, and even now when you ask them, they say they can't even live. 80% of people say they can't live with a 30% downturn. But I tell you what, a 30% downturn on, on taking a test and a 30% downturn in actuality is two totally different things. Watching your portfolio go from a million down to 660, that's huge. Watching your portfolio go from 300 down to 200, that's huge. That is, that is panic um, inciting, okay? So I just want to, again, I, I, I do these about every uh, five, six weeks just to make sure because it's easy for us to get, you know, the siren song of the market going up. It's easy for us to start to doubt what we're doing. Don't. You're doing the right things. I cannot. T I still have people come up today. I haven't been an advisor for 17 years, but I have guys come up today and say, Mike, 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 I thought I'd let you know. And this just happened about, uh, about, uh, about a year ago, twice uh, about a year ago. I had uh, two clients come up and say, you know what, Mike? I can't thank you enough. You've made my retirement. So many of my, 
my uh, friends told me I was foolish for investing in that annuity that you sold me. They told me I was foolish, but you know what? I've had a way better retirement. I have more money now than they have because they went through both the 2000 and the 2008 crashes. I was the smart person and they all, they all told me, every one of my friends told me I was stupid. I was the smart one. Thank you. That's the kind, that's what you want when you run into a client 17 years, when they're, when they're 82 years old. That's what you want clients to say, guys. Does that make sense? So, sorry for getting my soapbox here, but dudes, we got to do the right thing for the clients. It's not our money. It's theirs. And waiting for 10 years is not something we should be asking for a, a client. Make sense? So, be in the market, but be in guaranteed too. Thanks for being on. Talk to you. Let's see you next week. Yeah, next week. Thanks, everybody.